Yeah, we are so happy to introduce to you in this World Hospital Congress uh, this session um, coordinated by Healthio and MAP, which is um, a coordination effort of Altaya Center, uh, FUP, the Foundation of University of Bages, and Abinen. Thank you very much for being here in this such a busy day, and we are very happy to be here after all this pandemic and seeing so many people together. Uh, with us, Dr. Uh, my name is Dr. Jorge Serrano Pons. I'm the co-founder of Healthio, and we are so excited to be back with you. Let me introduce to you, Dr. Bartomeu Olaya, please, Bartomeu. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Of behalf of Healthio and MAP, welcome to the 44 International Hospital Congress specialization in the space. First of all, let me thank you all for coming here today. The application of technology to the healthcare sector is now a reality. You are here experts using 3D technology, 3D printing, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, among others. Our country has great potential in technological development and application as a result. Many initiatives have emerged such as the one we present to you today, or the one you will be able to see during four days of the Congress. Finally, we would like to invite you to visit the stand area uh, where you can check in real time what the we are doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bartomeu. Uh, this is a big effort by MAP, uh, as I told you, Altaya, to, uh, to set up this, this venue downstairs. We recommend it to all of you visit it because it, it shows a lot of services integrated that they're offering this innovation in this uh, specific territory which is the city of Manresa and surroundings for the ones who are listening to us from outside our country. Um, we start very quickly with this uh, section of 3D uh, from Robert Tumeolaya has been uh, pushing a lot from this field we want to show you three or four talks about 3D printing and the possibilities from that sense. Starting again, Dr. Bartomeu Olaya and Dr. Xavier Girones, 3D printing opportunities for the production of dysphagia foods. Thank you very much. A little bit of applause sometimes would be good, eh? We are the doctors, Xavier Gironés and Bartomeu Ayala. We are the coordinators of the, of the map. Thirty-five percent of the people over the age of 65 have trouble swallowing, which can lead to the malnutrition, dehydration in the crisis of the quality of life and can lead to severe respiratory infections in the food and subindalax. the lungs. In Spain, there are currently 2 million people with this disorder, a figure that in Europe is 30 million and in expectorage, 120 million by 2050. In Spain, more than 1,143 million annually, more than 2 percent hill expenditure. The problem that is dysphagia. In the first, in the first video, you can observe normal deglutition. The second video, you can see a person with dysphagia and the problem is deglutition. The food stays in the pharyngea. You can see in the picture the HT person corresponds to oro oropharyngeal dysphagia. Touch off. In the first case, patients can swallow a type of liquids, not even water. Mixed texture, people can heat an orange because of the filaments in the texture of the they can swallow. Let us, for example. In the most severe cases, the people can swallow bread or meat. This scheme we show you is very important. 50% of these five other patients have bronchospiration, or the 50 percent have pneumonia, and the 50 percent of these die. 
Other important consequence of dysphagia, social isolation. The effects of dysphagia made the moment of eating and pleasant, and it has negative impact on self-esteem. Most patients with dysphagia are socially isolated, representing frequent mood disorders on depression. The current solutions, malls. They are a very expensive solution, and they are very unattractive to the patients. Max of Puras. They mix all the tastes and the flavors, and the eye are not visually attractive. Currently, hospital use the prepared solution, which are the cheaper. 3D printed food warranties, correct texture, separate flavors and tastes, guarantees correct nutritional state of the, the patients, increase patient safety, and can be customized to the patient taste condition, nutritional needs, etc. We increase the quality of life and we return the pleasure of eating to the patient. Nutrial 3D provides a personalized, effective and the safe date for those with solowy problems, improving the quality of life and ensuring good nutritional status. The partners this project have, uh, has been possible thanks to the cooperation on the many different professionals working towards common goal. You can see doctors, chef, TD printing chef, nurses, speech therapists, nutritionists, therapists, caregivers, and experts in 3D printing. And let's not forget people who uh, have this fire, who have cooperated in the testing and giving their opinions. How it works. Natural products from the kitchen to the 3D printing. The video, please. You can see how the printer works. Each food in the other side separately into in the capsule. The dish is customized on the computer according to the shape of the original food or this. And printing begins. People with dysphagia in our residence where as with this is the goal like most to eat, this were the prepare and the cooking be you be at hospital or school and validated by experts and the patients with dysphagia. Examples Caesar salad, potato omelette, patatas bravas, Hibernian ham croquettes, vegetable lasagna, fish stew, rice pudding. The curious things, when the patient had never been able to taste letters, another one haven't had patatas bravas in 20 years. The general opinion was that the 3D printed food taste was the same as the real one. Another patient claimed that if restaurants could have this technology, they could be able to enjoy a with their family. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ayala. I have only one minute. Uh, currently, uh, at the present, uh, the Nutrial 3D Consortium uh, is developing a full range of uh, uh, dial menus from breakfast uh, to uh, lunch, uh, diner, or desserts, and some, uh, some snacks, too. Uh, the main objective, the principal objective of, the, of this uh, project uh, is uh, guarantee uh, the nutritional status uh, and the correct hydration level uh, of the patients. For example, we can offer uh, in these dishes uh, uh, chocolate cake, orange, uh, uh, pear, kiwi, patatas bravas, etc., and drinks uh, such as coffee, late coffee, uh, wine, sangria, yes, sangria too. And in December in uh, 2021, uh, uh, we have a research phase of validation uh, of the menus uh, by the experts uh, in January of uh, 2022. Uh, we will uh, start a pilot study focusing uh, in all our uh, 3D uh, menus, uh, food creations, in order to evaluate the satisfaction and uh, the impact uh, in, in life uh, of uh, our uh, uh, dysphagic sample. Uh, to summarize the whole 
the uh, the whole process. Uh, you can see that uh, we started the activity with the concept phase, uh, thanks to asking the question, uh, how uh, do we make these phasic people enjoy food again? And uh, uh, in this direction, uh, we created a focus group. Uh, the activity of this focus group, uh, we were able to collect uh, proposal of dishes, uh, test preference, recovery of flowers, personal perceptions and sensations. Uh, in the second phase, uh, we were able to create uh, uh, dishes, identifying their elements, uh, planning and facilitating the 3D design. Uh, and in this way, we were able to uh, I'll, 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 I'll create uh, all the uh, 3D planning and uh, how to transfer the culinary conception uh, to the 3D food printing machine. Uh, in the future, the next phases are focused on creating the pilot test uh, with the aim of validating the uh, shape, texture, distribution of the elements on the plate and testing the results with these basic people uh, uh, to asking the questions, uh, how do uh, they enjoy the food again and uh, they were again the flowers, uh, it's, it's safe. Uh, are they excited? And finally, uh, I'll, we, we will have a, a pilot study uh, and a clinical study uh, for scientific validation of all the process. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, the first thing. Thank you. Thank you very much both. You have been quite accurate, eight minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, you don't know, but we have one minute more because uh, from the Ethiopia, finally, we will have not the capacity to have the connection with it. So we'll have, but don't, don't dare to go beyond eight minutes, please, because if not, we will not finish. Uh, try to, as Dr. Gironet say, how we can make people with dysphagia enjoy food again, this flash, this new, no? If you can, the next sessions, give one sentence, would be nice, because they're waiting for a press release in one hour. And they're asking me to have some keynotes if you facilitate the work, it would be amazing. Thank you very much. Um, the next in, in line is uh, Dr. Rosé Ferré. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosé Ferré, because she's taking a plane soon. So thank you. Hello. Yes, I, I am talking and I'm flying to the airport. OK. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, thank Dr. Bartomeu Ayala for inviting me to this Congress. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Ferré, I'm a general and digestive surgeon, and today's topic will be innovation and 3D printing technology implementation in surgery. First of all, I'll begin with an, a need that we would like to, uh, to have um, a special, a specific ima images well done, well, better seen than in CT scan or MRI. Uh, so uh, with the collaboration of a local uh, enterprise, which is Avinen, uh, we began working with them. We have this materialized Mimics Viewer, which is the program they use. And from CT scan or MRI, we can have from 2D to dimension, which are CT scan or MRI, we can have these 3D Im images that you can see in the middle. So we can see better the structures we are looking for. For example, in this case, uh, this is a 3D reconstruction from CT scan. Then I, I don't know if I can show you, but the small notes, yes, this small note in here probably neither surgeons nor radiologists couldn't see by CT scan. And now with a printed uh, model we saw, and we can print uh, uh, all together, handle it, working with uh, residents, students, uh, among surgeons, and planification of the surgery. Uh, a lot better uh, before we uh, stay in the theater. Another thing is you know, with the students, in this case, uh, in the dissection room, uh, students in the UBIC can, uh, can have the death liver and uh, ne next to the, to the liver, the printed one, which came separately and they can assemble and disassemble. Uh, it's a joke, but it came like in Ikea, uh, disassemble and I had to uh, for assemble it together. Uh, it's a lot of Im uh, important uh, the 3D reconstruction in cases of hernias. In the first one, for example, uh, we can see exactly 
that it's the colon, the one who is herniated to the uh, thoracic cavity. So if we damage this structure, because we don't know, uh, probably there is fecal contamination during this maneuver, the outcome is different, and the patient is going worse. So if you know, we can prepare this colon, and if we damage it, the outcome is the same one day and, uh, and home, because we can stitch and nothing happens. In the second picture, the, the one which is drawn, it's the, from materialized, and the one in the left, it's while operating. So it's exactly the same, the image that materialized can give, a, can give us, so the same that we can see in the theater. So it's absolutely reliable, this 3D um, uh, reconstruction. Surgeons work with uh, soft tissues, and nowadays we are so far as we would like to be. We can, you can see, uh, I am touching these structures, they are hard, they cannot be stitchable, the, uh, and it's something that surgeons would like to practice, a stitch that, the issue, that issues. Uh, but we are working on that, in, on, the, on the right at the, of your screen, you can see there is uh, something, it's like some layers uh, recreating abdominal wall. It's so far from reality, yes, we know, but at least we could stitch, so we are on the way, uh, and we're working with that. And another step forward is having the same materialized program, but now we can see the models in 3D reconstruction. First of all, we saw the 3D reconstruction in 2D in our screens. Now we can see them into the, the, into the glasses. So the, the, the reliability, sorry, real, well, it's more real <laughs> uh, uh, with these images. So in this first part of the presentation, I would like to conclude that 3D printing technology in surgery is going to change how to improve surgical planification, adjust medical scheduling, allocate resources better, optimize outcomes, increase patient safety, personalize medicine, teach medical personnel, and innovate new materials. Another thing absolutely different, oh, I'm sorry, it's, no, going back. I would like to show the video. Can you please uh, push the video without, I don't know, yes? No, well, uh, I would like to show you that uh, with what is Serintia, but uh, the video is, cannot be played. So uh, Serintia is something that you can see uh, outside, out, out there, that is the, the stand. It's a, a platform that we use uh, uh, to connect in, in our department from the inside of the theater to outside of the theater. Outside can be doctors, students, experts, residents, some, whatever you want, and the, uh, the outside can teach you, can guide you, can mentor. In this case, for example, the picture is a, it's a resident of our department, assisted by two surgeons, uh, and uh, on the one side of the operating that could be outside, but in this case, one side, and then which a, a screen connected with this Serintia tool, uh, some expert can teach, go to the blue line, don't go to the red line. So uh, you can imagine how useful can be this program because some people from other places can teach you how to do a surgery. And outside, you, if you want, you can uh, see that. Finally, uh, we have different other kinds of technology. One of them is pelvic trainer. It's something that uh, residents and, uh, and surgeons use to improve surgical skills. And uh, I'll tie you with the collaboration of um, one student from Robert Virgilis University made this first approach of an electronic pelvic trainer, which, are, which is being tested uh, nowadays uh, by us. And uh, finally, some ideas came up uh, in, your, in daily surgery, in a specific uh, step of the surgery, that we use this tool uh, usually, but probably we, we need to improve that. Then we have an idea, we print this uh, model, this, uh, this thing. So this seems to be very useful, so it's another step forward, this um, 3D um, printing. So, and this can be a, a message for you, for <laughs> what you have to read, to, to, to write. That is 3D printing technology in surgery is here to stay. All the tools that help us to better plan surgical procedure are essential just as virtual reality glasses, which have had an amazing acceptance by our surgical team. Uh, having access to a simulation room at hospital is the key to practice these diffi difficult uh, clinical cases. I haven't said that, but we have a simulation room at our hospital that have a name also. 
uh, and uh, new technologies and innovations we are being provided with uh, must be used for the patient's benefit. So we are on the way to personalize medical attention and focusing on the patient's safety and well-being. So this is the way. And finally, last but not least, uh, having ideas are imperative to innovate. Once you have an idea, then the sky is the limit and you can do whatever you want. So thanks for coming and... Uh, and <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dr. Ferrer. A good flight. <laughs> thank you very much. We, we continue with Dr. Uh, Ferran Fillat uh, with the impact of the 3D technology in the hospital ecosystem. Thank you very much, Ferran. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jordi. Thank you, Bartomeu, for the invitation to participate in this Congress and show to how 3D printing is changing uh, our clinic plastic practice today and the entire hospital ecosystem. So, okay. 4.0 industrialization is affecting globally all the disciplines. And 3D printing is one of these disruptive technologies that help transformation to happen faster. I will show how we integrated it in the hospitals ecosystem for the benefit for the patients and we can say that 3D printing is not the future in the hospitals now we can say it's the present so our goal in the 3D printing lab is uh, to bring 3D printing in two in four approaches the first one is clinical practice clinical practice um, to be used uh, always under a medical prescription when there is no standardized treatment that would provide a solution for the patient. The second one is to be used for doing research, both experimental or clinical research, for, to, in order to provide evidences of clinical benefits of the 3D printing or improve design or new techniques uh, related with medical devices. Three, for prototyping of innovative medical devices. And four, finally, to share our knowledge about uh, the field to students or specialists to expand the usage of 3D printing. So all current applications are uh, combined in different approaches. Our mission is raising clinical evidence about medical processes related with 3D technology. We work in projects together with clinicians producing a translational research. We are also a research group. And at the same time, we offer biomedical engineering services to medical device companies, hospitals, or organizations for the devel development of new applications in 3D printing and the development of medical device. So next, I will show you some examples of current clinical applications in our lab. The first one is CAT surgery. We're starting, uh, it's a starting point to the digitalization of the surgical process. Our unit plans together with the main surgeons their cases. We are able to standardize surgical procedures, such as positioning of implants in orthopedic surgery. More examples of current clinical application that we have is anatomical models, are anatomical models. For diagnosis and preoperative planning, uh, for adaptation of conventional implants to the patient's anatomy. We use also anatomical models for preoperative surgical simulation, or for example, inside the operating room to, planify, uh, to prepare the shaping, for example, of a bone allograph. We also have patient-specific instrumentation. We can uh, do a specific instrumentation in order to guide implant positioning, doing uh, guided osteotomies in reconstructive surgery, or for example, to guide uh, some reconstruction in fractures, for example, in scaphoid fractures. Also, are uh, good, or we prove that uh, with patient-specific instruments, we can do bone guided tunnelings. And finally, to, ch to, to close the circle, we can do also patient-specific implants in order to uh, uh, execute uh, uh, perfectly 
the 3D surgical plan with patient-specific guides. And in this case, how you can see, uh, use a, a specific implant to a correction of tetany of distal radius. So we have published, uh, we have seen uh, in these last three years several findings, uh, and we have published. I show you the most relevant. Uh, we can uh, uh, show that the, the, we increase the high uh, interobserver reality in fractures. We de uh, demonstrate that the uh, reduction uh, of an unexpected events in the operating room. We also demonstrate a 50% saving time in surgery in some procedures. We demonstrate uh, a, save, a cost saving in revision surgery in orthopedic an amount of 3,000 uh, euro per case. We also demonstrate an increase of accuracy in implant positioning. positioning. We can save up to 70% of uh, X-ray exposure per procedure and an average of 23 minutes of time per uh, procedure when we use patient-specific instrumentation. That it's 100 euros per surgery. So our numbers are 22 projects. We have already created two spin-offs. We can standardize 10 clinical uh, procedures in surgery. We participate in two European projects, six publications in quarter one, one. 14 biomedical engineers has uh, uh, collaborated with us in, an, in different internships. We finished five doctoral thesis related and 400 and a half uh, patients were uh, treated with 3D printing applications. So these are some references. And to, sorry, to conclude, we can say that computer surgery anatomical models combined with PSAI guides has demonstrated a clinical benefit for the patient and increased the efficiency of the surgical procedures. The medical device industry is undergoing a transformation towards personalization. So 3D technology uh, and 3D hospital lab enables a smoother and safe transition to standardization personalized medical device related procedures. As a researcher, we work with clinicians to increase the clinical evidence in new 3D printing medical applications thanks to our accumulated knowledge and our three platform services. Thanks to my team. And if you want to contact us, I'm, it's a pleasure to, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferran Fillat. It's a clear example no, of the outcomes, 22 projects to spin off. Also, Dr. Rosé Ferré, which is not here anymore, but show many uh, outcomes and results already. Now we give uh, the, the word to Dr. Arnau Weiss. Um, let me, because we change the title. 3D planning, simulation, and research of soft tissues in a reference pediatric hospital. Thank you, Arnau. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me and our team to the, uh, this Congress. Um, there's been many talks on, on 3D printing, so I'm going to say a few things new, but I'm going to try to give the perspective of a pediatric uh, hospital and how it impacts to have personalization and personalized therapies uh, in pediatrics. Um, so probably you know that uh, in the last decade, only 24% of FDA-approved medical devices were meant for pediatric use. And if we go to drugs, more than 50% of drugs that are prescribed in pediatrics are not meant uh, and are off-label, so not meant for pediatric. So why is that, that pediatrics, that will be our future, are so less paid attention and we invest so few in our children? So that's even worse. So more than 50% of uh, rare diseases are in children and 80% are of genetic uh, initiation. So that's huge. That means that uh, there's a huge amount of pediatric illnesses that are rare. That means that are unique. So if we need personalization, um, there's a technology that can help. And in that case, 3D printing, patient-specific 
solutions uh, can help advance a little bit on, on that. Um, in our hospital, we have many applications, but today I'm going to focus mainly on anatomical models, surgical guides, implants, and other medical devices. And to start with one, in fact, a rare disease, neuroblastoma. It's an oncologic uh, case, uh, surgery, in which 3D printing helps a lot in the calculation of the resection of the volume of tumor that uh, the surgeon uh, will be able to take out. And that will help on defining after the surgery the treatment that this patient will have. And that's, that's huge. That helps a lot on, on those patients. Those cases, uh, before, uh, we used to create the 3D model so that they can practice. And now, uh, virtually, we can solve most of the problem in 80% of the cases. But in those very, very complex cases, we still uh, print the, the, the model so that uh, the surgeon can practice uh, with, the virtual, uh, with the physical phantom and uh, can find the surgery and practice it with the anatomy of the patient before going to the actual surgery. Another case is hepatic mesenchymal hematoma, uh, another complex uh, case of oncological surgery in which here uh, we need to define very well the, resec the resection uh, of the tumor to not take uh, vessels of, of the patient. On that, we are doing research with the University uh, Polytechnic of Catalonia and other um, companies and, and universities to help define new materials and new ways of manufacturing prototypes that can help practice to the surgeon. But another key example, imagine a surgery that has to be done ex utero with a laser therapy. That means that has to be done in the fetus while the fetus is inside the mother. Here, the time is key. You, need, you have few time for the surgery. So all the time that you can practice before entering the surgery, it's gold for the surgeons to define the best approach. And here is where uh, 3D printing and having the anatomy of the patient and technology here in, in imaging processing can help a lot. That's a project that we did together with a group of Dr. Eduard Gratacos of Bethene Natal. But not only that, if we take these technologies and we merge them with all the methodologies of simulation, then we can create a full practice and uh, training for new surgeons or old surgeons with the specific techniques. Uh, together with the Simulation Darwin Center of San Juan de Deu, we create patient-specific um, models to practice and phantoms in which they can uh, practice and, and make uh, different uh, courses to practice specific um, simulations. And with them, merging these two technologies, 3D printing, virtual reality, but also molding using uh, silicons, we can design and create, um, for example, phantoms like that one, which is to take out a uh, nasal foreign body in uh, resident nurses and ju junior surgeons, or another more complex, uh, which is, for example, the uh, practice of a highly realistic simulation for a robot-assisted uh, hypothalamic amaratoma in real time. That's a, a new treatment highly technological, that was the first time that was performed in the hospital, and that uses a laser, a laser guided with MRI to take out seizures from epileptic patients. So this surgery, as it was the first time and it needed from radiologists, surgeons, but also the technical staff, um, was recreated before going to the surgery so that it can be done one or twice with all the procedures and the methodology before going to the real surgery with the patient. That was a success and, and was published. So finally, results, you know, uh, the other uh, have already uh, told about that, but basically we improve clinical outcomes. It's not something about the past, it's the present, and we hope that we will see a lot of more in the future. It's about security and quality. We've uh, demonstrated a 30% reduction of uh, surgical time and finally improved patient, professional, and family comprehension and experience but also we created medical devices specific for patients. And I think here it's also something very useful. So patient-specific uh, medical devices prototyped or for those patients that don't have on the market solutions tailored for their own, and that's something that happens more than when we, what we may think uh, in pediatrics, it's key and can also help a lot. And also we, we've seen that on, on COVID situation. Uh, so most of people here and hospitals work together to find solutions uh, thanks to 3D printing in the point of demand. So if 
Uh, children now it's only the 24% of our present, but are the 100% of our future. Why are we not investing more in them? And I think here it's something that goes beyond 3D printing and 3D technologies, and more investments needs to be done in, in this. Um, finally, and before finishing, uh, I just want you to present uh, a hub that we are coordinating in San Juan de Deu, the Pediatric Innovation Hub. Uh, there's a lot of uh, institutions here that are part of it and that had the first Pediatric Innovation Day uh, last week. So um, it's focused on pushing for innovations in, in pediatrics. Thank you. Before turning into the digital health um, chapter, uh, anyone has a quick question for these 3D printing technologies? You didn't know you had to ask, but uh, better. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go. Now we go. We move into the field of um, digital health. Now we have uh, Dr. Josep Vidal talking about asynchronic communication with primary care health services, the e-consultation. Thank you very much. Okay. Josep. Thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Today I'm going to talk about something that maybe most of you, you already know because I see many familiar faces here, but today I'm going to talk about uh, a consultation. Okay. A consultation is an asynchronous teleconsultation services between the citizens and healthcare professionals. It started in 2005, but really it, it wasn't until the 2017, sorry, that it came, became established and it was used for all the primary care teams in, in Catalonia. Originally, uh, was meant to be used by family physicians, but then it was also moved to, to be used for pediatricians, midwives, and nurses in primary care. And, and now very recently, it also has been also introduced in, in hospitals, so the consultants in hospitals can use this tool. It's, in, it's important because this is a full integrated tool into the Catalonian healthcare records. And this is important because, uh, in my case, a consultation is just another way of, of seeing patients. For, for instance, in, my, in a, a daily list of patients that I have, I may have 14 face-to-face -face visits. Nowadays, eh? I mean, this is real. 14 face-to-face -face visits. Then I may have four to six uh, telephone calls. And then I have four to six e-consultations and they are fully integrated. I have a protected time to reply to these consultations. And I, I think this is very important. It's not something I have to do uh, as an add-on. This is part of my routine work. Okay. As I said, from the patient's point of view, this is part of the personal health folder. So it's fully integrated in this personal health folder. I'll show you some pictures, but basically this is a personal health folder. You have the a consulta, a consultation, but also the patient has access to, to certificates, COVID-19 certificates, medication, some reports, blood tests, uh, diagnostics, and also you can do some other kind of bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic, uh, uh, bueno. Uh, as I say, this is part, a consultation is part of the, of the electronic health folder, and I show you, this is the actual interface. This, this first one is interface used by the patient. Okay, so the patient can use if you want to interact with the primary care services or the hospital service. They just write uh, the reason to consultate, and then they, they write uh, what, what they want. Also, they can choose the different top from different topics. They can choose from if they want to review prescriptions, if they want to do a clinical query, or they want to do some administrative task. Okay, and also it's important that you can add some 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 folders, and you can add some documents to the to your query. And the other one, the other interface is the one that sees the 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 healthcare professional. And you can also add some information. You can attach a folder. You can attach uh, a blood test. 
you can attach some documents. Okay. Of course, uh, everything has changed since COVID. And actually, we were very lucky that we have this tool before COVID started. So basically, we could use this tool. It was implemented. It was used, but not a lot. Uh, we checked, and it was about 5.6 uh, visits per thousand inhabitants before COVID. And then it jumps to 33 uh, visits per 1,000 inhabitants after the COVID. So we were lucky that we could use this tool because I think it helped us a lot to, to reduce the, the spread of the infection because it allowed us to do, uh, to avoid face-to-face -face visits. Actually, we use air consultations, as I say, for, for the prescriptions, also to, to handle sick notes as well, and even to, to do some clinical consultations. I mean, this has been a huge success. And last week, uh, we had 13, 13 million consultations from a consulta. It's, we are doing about 100,000 a week of a consultas. And it's used by 18 healthcare professionals and 1 million and 700 citizens. So as I said, it has been a, a huge success. And we are very lucky to have it in place before the COVID. If we had to implement it with the COVID, it would have been much more difficult. And this is just what happened. I mean, we were using a consulta before the COVID, but you can see what happened with the, with the beginning of, of, the, of the pandemic, that it just increases exponentially. Not the, the professional use, because we were already using it, but the citizen use and the number of consultations. I mean, the interesting things about what happened with the COVID, that we have a much younger profile of, of users. Before COVID was about 50, the, the, the main age of the user was about 50 years, and, and now it's 45. Mainly we had, um, the user were from urban settings, and now we are more, more rural. So it has changed, okay? It has been used a lot for, for the younger patients, of course, because they are, they are used to it. So they have taken advantage of, of this tool. And again, here you can see what happened with COVID. Uh, as the, all the face-to-face -face visit dropped, we are lucky to have the consulta and some of the consultations they could be moved to, to the consulta. Something we are very proud of is we are evaluating continuously this, this tool. I mean, we have done a lot of research on the tool, and even some of the results of the research ha we have been, it has been used to improve the tool. For instance, the different topics that you can check from when, when you do a consultation, it came from, from our research. And we are doing some machine learning because, as you can see, we, we have millions of, of data to use from. And it's something that we want to continue doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidal, for explaining your long experience in this field. And now, Dr. Americe Davins, how to transform the hospital with digital health. Thank you very much, Americe. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. Um, my name is Marcel Davins, and I am the Health and Digital Transformation Director at Germans Trias University Hospital. And I'm going to talk about how to transform the hospital with digital health. First of all, let's talk about digital transformation. The question is, what exactly is digital transformation? I'm a vascular surgeon. I'm not a technician, so um, the definition is from clinic. I think that digital transformation is not about technology. It's about people, networking, and culture. This is the message, Jordi, for the you put. Can you repeat it, please? <laughs> yes. Digital transformation is not about technology. Yeah. It's about culture, um, networking, and persons, people. 
Okay? Um, the most important thing is to find a need to make this digital transformation um, happen. Okay? Um, what do you need is a, the digital transformation is a change to contribute value. If you don't have a value, then you can you don't put you, know, you cannot implant. In 19 uh, in 2020, we, uh, all the whole society was attacked for COVID-19, and the healthcare system suffered a checkmate. The professionals were afraid and suffered a stress, despair, tightness, uh, but of cloud emotions, difficult to fight. And when we got home, we have uh, problems and the nightmare continue. If we can see here in the pictures, there is not very different things about the influenza of 20, in the early of 20s. There was a mask, digital, digital, uh, social distance, lockdowns. But if the pandemic taught us uh, something, is that together we are invincibles. In the first wave, the most important thing that we ask is how can we improve the follow-up of the patients? There were different projects. One of them was that, that's the, pro the COVID patients follow-up. We have um, patients from the emergency room and patients who has been hospitalized. And when we're discharged, we have a app to follow up. Why? Because the professionals were afraid. Because we don't know, we didn't know what happened with the patients after the discharge. Um, we, uh, all the patients that was, when we were discharged receive every day a message and uh, they have to answer these questions. It was very easy um, answer, uh, questions. How do you feel today? Do you have a temperature? Do you find it hard to breathe? Do you have diarrhea? All of this data were to the EHR. And then uh, when the patient was worse, a red alarm appeared like a traffic light system. Then we have a team of doctors, um, anatomopathologists, radiologists, on something patients, um, doctors that don't use normally patients, um, they, then they f do the follow-up. And then when the patient was worse, they phone it, phone them. The results, we have 1,065 patients follow-up. 23% of red alarms appear. About complications, zero patients go to the ICU and zero patients die. And the satisfaction of the patients was 8.8 .8 out of 10. We can see that the result was improved the efficiency of the healthcare, empowerment of the patients and the professionals. And the most important thing is the improved satisfaction of the, of the patients and the professionals because they were uh, somebody that um, take care of her um, professional, I for care patients, and achieve better security. There were another things about uh, in geriatric residents or in the um, another apps from the home care, home hospitalization. And here, this is the graphic that show us Dr. Vidal about how changed the telemedicine in the COVID. No, you can see here. Let's say the consulta is the orange one that it rose. Another thing that it's an oncology society pool that before COVID patients, more than 45% of doctors, oncologists, had never used the, uh, any telematic visits. After COVID pandemic, 99% of doctors use uh, at least phone visits. And where are we going? We are going to the personalized medicine, center patient, and prevention and anticipated medicine, integral and integration. As you can see here, telemedicine is not new. In this newspaper, 1924, they used telemedicine. And how we can improve it? There is different, we have to do a telemedicine 2.0. It's a, um, and some technology can help us, like IoT, gamification, big data, and all of these things can help us to improve telemedicine. Why? Because we have to change the chronic models to the paternalistic model to anticipatory model. 
because the patient is the clue. And how? With the three pillars. For f the first one is telemonitoring. This is not only IoT. It's about uh, sometimes patients need a questionnaire, vital constants, depends on the, pa the pathology. The second one is empowerment of the patient. Why? Because the patient is the uh, use, uh, use resource, um, the user list resource. Why? Um, all the patients are, uh, oh, see, sorry. The patient is the person who has to stay 24 hours in um, the pathology. So if we improve empowerment him, it's easy to uh, show, raise his hand for he have a problem. And then somebody have to help him. This is the third pillar, the communication. We need a very good channels because when the, the patient raise the hand, somebody can help him. And all of these can help, the gamification can help them because this is an engagement. So we have to, um, to take the COVID um, pandemic to an opportunity because we are the team and together we are invincibles. Thank you. Thank you, Marite, for trying and being there to transform in, in this case with the skills of digital health. Thank you very much. Now we proceed with Elisenda Casanellas. Thank you very much. Thank you for explaining us a bit, Cinti, the great um, work that Cinti is always doing. And the, um, sorry, innovations from Catalonia during pandemic times. Thank you, Elisenda. Thank you very much for the invitation. And good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Lezenda Casanellas. I'm here as the Chief Operations Officer uh, of Cinti. And I will briefly introduce you what this is and give you a couple of examples on projects that we support that have adapted the value proposition during pandemic times in a very interesting way. So Cinti uh, is a project that we have in collaboration with the Department of Health of the Catalan government, and we have uh, strategic alliances with Boston CIMIDS, as well as the Healthcare Living Lab Catalonia and Healthio and Fira de Barcelona. Like that? Okay. So a little bit about, about Cinti. What we do is that uh, we promote health and social innovation, and we help uh, innovators and entrepreneurs get their products to the market faster. So at the moment, we have supported uh, 41 projects. One of them, for example, is Nutrial 3D that just uh, Bartomeu Ayala just uh, presented before. Those projects have raised 20 million euros. Five projects are already in the market. Uh, they have been uh, in several uh, hospitals impacting already 200,000 patients. Uh, our services are estimated in around 45,000 um, um, euros. And we have lots of collaborations within the Catalan health ecosystem and more than 900 people in our community. So what we do, it's basically in three phases. Innovators can present their proposals to our calls. We evaluate them, and those that are selected can have access to our programs and to our services, which uh, are mainly these 10 services here. And this is this a laser? No, oh, sorry. OK. So um, sorry, I did that, right? Yeah. <laughs> OK. So uh, basically, we, we support them in, in 10 different areas, uh, assessing them uh, with different exper experts in terms of their technological needs, clinical needs, medical device regulation, market and business, funding, communication, training, mentoring, uh, access to the experts from CIMIT, and access to the health and social public institutions. And we do all that in order to accelerate their time to market. And we do that by using a specific methodology that we adapted from CIMIT uh, from Boston, and we adapted it to, to our ecosystem. So um, let me explain to you a couple of case studies of projects that we, that we have supported, and, and they have been able to uh, evolution in a very interesting way. So the first one is Good Gut that pro you probably heard of. And I will explain specifically this, this product. They have uh, several, but right CRC, was designed uh, answering to the need of uh, uh, the screening of colorectal cancer. The uh, technique that is being used nowadays um, is colonoscopy, and it's very expensive and it's very invasive. So usually in, in current clinical practices, uh, they use non-invasive tests, such as the fecal immunochemical, immunochemical, oh, sorry, <laughs> immunochemical test. 
and the feet. But this leads to up to 30% of unnecessary colonoscopies due to false positive. So what they did is they created a tool that is non-invasive and complements the feed test, re significantly reduces the number of colonoscopies, and you can detect CRC early and reliably without discomfort to patients and in, with a lower cost. So the idea was uh, the current gold standard is you get the current test, the feed, and if it's positive, then you get the colonoscopy. And by using this product, the idea is you get the feed, if it's positive, you use their product, right CRC, and only if it's positive, you get the colonoscopy. If not, the idea would be that you don't need the colonoscopy. Um, so if, these, uh, if you don't miss any cancer here, in the future, uh, this might be the new gold standard to detect uh, colorectal cancer. Okay. So, but what happened uh, at, during pandemic time, the needs changed. And what happened is that uh, there was a reduction of the number of colonoscopies because they had to clean uh, everything. So it, it was impossible to, to perform as much colonoscopies as before. So there, and the restriction of patients' uh, visits to the hospital. So these led to two things. The CRC screening program stopped and those are the, the people who don't have symptoms yet. But then for the symptomatics, it was a saturation of CRC symptom, symptomatic diagnosis. So here, GoodGut saw uh, a new need. They identified uh, the need of uh, the priorization of CRC symptomatics. So I have symptoms, I, I do the feed seeds positive, and there's a lot of positives. Who gets the colonoscopy first? Is there a way to prioritize? It? So that, that was the problem. So what they, the idea is, okay, if you are positive, you do our test, and you, if you are positive again, then you have priority one, whereas if you are negative, you have priority two. So, and this, uh, uh, it's very simple, and it's, it's already being used in Belvija Hospital and Clinical Hospital for some months now, and it has helped them a lot in decreasing the saturation of the diagnosis of uh, symptomatic CRC patients. So as you can see, uh, they managed to get uh, to, to provide even more value uh, doing the same that they were doing. And the second uh, example is Dimbit and Dimbit and Plug and Health and the, the evolution from Dimbit, because actually Dimbit uh, is a it's, it's a technology for for animal health. It, it, it's a telemedicine for monitoring uh, pets. So they, they had uh, this device, which is a, a device and a hardware and a software, real-time monitoring, without wires, alert system, ubiquitous is not a restriction. But what happened during pandemic time, I mean, they, they have a, a company, it's, it's a business, it works. So during pandemic times, what happened is that a hospital, German Stres de Pujol, uh, uh, requested them if they could uh, monitor a field hospital using that technology. So um, what they did is that in a very short period of time, they evolved from um, remote monitoring medical device for, for the, the, the device I just showed you, and they uh, set it up, the field hospital. They uh, prototyped more human health uh, devices, and in the end, they ended up having this Plug and Health Sentinel, which is their new product in, for humans. And, and they are in, well, they have been using it in, in the hospital of Barcelona, with the hospital German Stiers de Pujol, they are, they are still uh, working on it. And in the end, it's, a, it's an adaptation of a, an already existing technology, but during pandemic times, in this case, they really changed because they moved to animals, to human health, with a really uh, successful way of, of doing that. So, this is all from me. I just wanted to, to show you this couple of examples because these are the kind of projects uh, that we like to give support at SIMTI, which are projects that have a ba strong value proposition, that, that have a potential to have a high impact in, in patients. And in terms of, of difficulties, they were able to uh, improve the value proposition and, and give even more uh, added value and more impact to, to patients. So this is all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisenda. And we are concluding that other um, field, and now we are opening the international uh, arena uh, with uh, Dr. Iñaki Alegria, an innovative approach to build an emergency hospital in Ethiopia. Thank you, Iñaki.
Well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this, to this Congress. I'm very happy to be here. So first of all, I want to show you Ethiopia, not only as a poor country, that maybe you can think that Ethiopia is a poor country that just they need our help. So just I want to change this idea and to show Ethiopia as a model, as a role model country, as an innovation country, and, as a, and just to show what can we learn from Ethiopia. So yes, we have also made one, one incident. This session I need to share with Dr. Tigis, that is a, is a young, young woman, is a research head of one of the most important hospitals in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. But maybe you know what Ethiopia is in very big problem. There is an important war in all the countries. So due to this problem, she cannot connect and share their experience with, with us. So I will talk also about her experience in this main important hospital. So, well, first of all, I want also to show you, I tell you that we can learn a lot from Ethiopia, but also we need to consider that there is a, a big difference between the capital, Addis Ababa, that we can see with skylines, with big roads, highways, but also there is a rural area, and that is, in fact, sure, is very poor. So we need to consider the both realities in this Ethiopia. But anyway, I think we can learn from both of them. And I will show you the experience in the in Addis Ababa Hospital, where Dr. Tigis is working, and also my experience in Gambo Rural Hospital, that maybe is one of the poorest areas in, in Ethiopia. So first of all, going to Addis Ababa. How we can, they changed a um, conference hall they change these conference halls into a hospital. In, during the pandemic, during the first wave, they create a 1,000 bed hospital in very few months. And let us see how we can, in which way they can do it very fast. So this is the images of all this, this hospital, how this, they change this conference hall into a really excellent hospital, maybe this, this picture can be taken in any European hospital, but this is Addis Ababa Conference Hall. Also this, I think it's very important to, to learn about, about this. They have also all the equipment, ventilators, and for me, maybe this is the most important person. All of this is possible due to an excellent human resources with very professional, medical medical staff or health health staff i think they are role models and we need to learn from of them in five minutes i cannot explain a lot of them but just i want to tell you that maybe all of us for sure we can learn a lot of these young people this is the well just numbers but i think that in each number this an a human being a person that is doing a really big effort and they have an excellent knowledge in Ethiopia. There is also excellent universities. I mean, the main idea is to consider also Ethiopia as an excellent, excellent and a leader in, in innovation, in medical innovation. Well, this is the... To adapt this conference hall, they need to, for sure, to structure all the transformation, to recruit the staff, to do trainings, to prepare protocols and, and guidelines. And they do it, really, we can see here, very fast. And this is the main structure. As I told you, 1,000 bed hospital with also intensive care units, 40 intensive care unit beds with, with ventilators, with oxygen. So really, I think I cannot go deeply, but if you are interested, I can show you the links also. One of the most important things maybe also is the, the patient flow. So, you know, to, to avoid contamination, to, to avoid, well, to, yes, to, to avoid contamination is very important to, to create a properly patient flow. So do, they do it excellent. And why? Maybe also because they have previous experience. They have previous experience with other outbreaks like measles outbreaks, meningitis, cholera, 
Ethiopia has not Ebola, but also other countries, also, also they create awareness. So they have previous experience, maybe for European countries was the first time for our generation, but for Ethiopian young doctors was not the first time facing this. So they get used to create an emergency hospital, to create a properly patient flow. They have the previous experience. Also, also they are ready to work on overload situation with shortage of resources. So they organize properly. And also in this situation, they do important studies and research. And also international, they publish in important international articles. We can see some of them samples, some, some of them. Then, as I told you, why for them was possible to do it that? So as I told you, the previous experience of measles, meningitis, cholera, to previously also they work in shortage with human resources, shortage of medicines, of health supplies, and was not the first time to do an emergency hospital. For sure, they work a, a, lot, of, a lot of weakness. Previously, we shared also this experience with Jordi. We created teleconferences also with the staff of Ethiopia at this time was possible. So the, it was an excellent that we, you can see. And also we published in one Spanish, in El País, Spanish publication, just to show, to think, maybe African countries, they do it better than us. So this is just a question. I recommend maybe to, to learn the full article to see in which way we can learn from, from them. This is the experience in the Addis Ababa. Now also maybe shortly let us focus how we can manage in a rural area, in Gambo, in the place that I'm working for almost 10 years in Gambo Hospital, coordinating the, the, the hospital. So first of all, we need to consider that due to the pandemic, for sure was a shortage of food. So first of all, we need to create emergency fat food distribution. Also to create community awareness, we need to inform the people what is COVID-19 disease, how they can prevent it. And we need to arrange to organize the hospital to create a, an isolation building to develop training and protocols and, and guidelines in the hospital to, to adapt also all the staff to protect our staff, for sure, it is very important. And maybe one of the most important issues in our rural area is the oxygen. We are talking here about innovation. For sure, innovation is very important, but we need to have maybe the most necessary. The main problem in Gambo is that we don't have enough oxygen. We don't have any ventilator at all, but also not enough oxygen. We only have oxygen cylinders that, due to the pandemic was not enough for, for all. And maybe one of the most important things was this simple piece. Thanks to this piece, we can divide one cylinder, not only for one patient, for two, three, four, six patients. So imagine maybe the innovation, the innovation at this time, the innovation that saves life was this piece that maybe we can ha also we have shortage of this, but with 3D, 3D printing is very easy to have this. So maybe this is, could be one, one idea for sure. This is very important. We need also more, more oxygen, but just to consider the different rate of priorities. Also, sure, very important, the, the hand washes was, was an, another. Despite all of this, I need to say that St. Paul Hospital, that was the hospital with we help to coordinate this conference host Millennium Hospital, was received the recognition of the Ethiopian Federal Ministry of Health. So they appreciate the, the effort of the management on the pandemic. And another thing, and maybe it's important, they, they perform a lot of simulation. So maybe it's important to make to be ready at any time to do simulation of emergency, emergency simulation. Well, this is the different phases. And the Ethiopian Public Health Institute also was doing a, a really an excellent follow-up of the pandemic. We have the 
weekly bulletin where they publish all the updates. This is an, an example of publication for they, they share this kind of items with all the population. And they have also the phone numbers to inform all population to any people that have any question related to COVID, they can call to, to this number. And also, this is was an innovation to develop a lot of telegram groups for health professionals, but also for general community, for, for hospital, for health information. So, I mean, this telegram is not working just only in Europe. Also in Ethiopia, was very important to create awareness in all the, in all the community. And also the mobile, mobile apps. They developed several mobile apps. So also a health working training platform that really was very useful for all the health staff to be updated on the new guidelines. Also to trace COVID-19 contacts with the mobile app. Also for the health staff to have just on hand all the updated guidelines. And also we, they, we support the Zero Mother's Day app that was very important also to, to be updated on pregnant mother management due to the pandemic. Well, just very, this is the, the different stage in Ethiopia. Maybe I want to, this is one of the main ideas also, that innovation, considering maybe innovation, maybe it's also to share innovation. Because I think that sometimes we are not sharing the innovation. So if we share innovation, this is also an innovation. So I call to share maybe the innovation with Ethiopia. Well, for sure, as the idea of Dr. Tedros, because also is Ethiopian, as you know, the best defense are against any outbreak is a strong healthcare system. So we are working in Gambo to improve the, the to make stronger the Ethiopian health health system. And maybe this is the main idea, Jordi, that wants to have the ideas of the presentation. The idea is that where, when I talk about the COVID-19 response in African countries, and I explain that they are doing excellent in, any, in some issues, this not, must not be a surprise. Why we need to surprise when Africa is doing better than us or when they are doing excellent? They can do it. And we need, we need to consider also this is as a normal, not just an, as a different issue. Well, and just to finalize, maybe you can put the sound. Look at heat magnet and the logos. Minister in the man of Bosch and Kota, Mefti Hill, Yakovid as a stain to pay my whale metagware, Kagugu Bamarit, Laras, we make Guzom Marajam, Magnetic Labu, Metagware, Basil Kola Michel, who cuts an adab. This is also a diff ad on the campaign for blood donation. Maybe the idea of this issue is that we need to adapt the message to our community. So in Ethiopia, the, there is a, also a very big shortage of blood. So we need to promote the blood donation in the community. And we need to, to reach community according to their culture. So this kind of message are very useful in the Ethiopian community. And all this is for adults, but also we need to focus also for children. So related to COVID-19 pandemics, there was also an, this kind of anim animated for address to
well, and maybe now, yes, the last one, maybe one of the most important issues, you know, is the hand washing. But we need to teach to how to hand wash to illiterate people that also they cannot read, they, they don't know how to read. So another issue is just to the model, to role model in, in the communities and accompanied but also by, mu but by music. Like, like this we do, we do especially in Gambo and in other rural areas of Ethiopia. <laughs> Well, that's all. Thank you very much. We have. Thank you, Inagi. We have we have given Inagi a little bit more of time. He has come on purpose from Ethiopia in war time, so I believe he deserved that. And I recommend you. I am biased because I'm working with him many projects in some projects. But I recommend you in your institutions to talk about innovation. Short messages, it's okay, it's difficult. But if you give him one hour, I can assure you he's an amazing person and, and with a lot of lean ideas. I saw Dr. Fran Fiat with the eyes when you talk about because they were developing these things that you needed there, no? And, and also Dr. Estevatria is about the blood donation topics and so on. Thank you very much, Naki, for coming from Ethiopia. And now we move from Ethiopia to Russia, to Russia, um, where uh, Dr. Kristina Sakurdaeva will explain us a little bit uh, what happened during pandemic times with clinical studies during the pandemic times in the Moscow area. Thank you, Kristina. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. I hope everyone can hear me well and you can see my screen. Not yet, Kristina. Okay, so Thank you. with the technical side because I'm sharing my screen. Yes, they are looking at it. Okay, good. So thank you very much, first of all, to the organizing committee for inviting me to be uh, with you at this Congress. Now, now of course, I wish I were. Now we are looking at it, Christina. We, we look. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much again for inviting me. And of course, I wish I were there with you in person in Barcelona. However, COVID is, um, of course, um, affecting a lot of areas of our lives, including participation. And of course, the clinical trials are no exception to that. So I'm going to speak a little bit uh, about what. Oops. I'm going to speak a little bit um, about what's going on in the field of and in Russia uh, in particular. So the um, COVID-19 uh, outbreak uh, with a substantial decrease in new clinical trial activations, as you can see here, especially for US-based uh, clinical trials. The study which examined more than uh, 62,000 uh, clinical trials found that the number uh, of studies initiated in the US February to May during the initial outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, last year was only 57% of what could, would have been expected uh, if the pandemic not occurred. The impact outside of the US was a little bit smaller with 77% uh, of the expected number of new studies launched. So this parallel similar for, for oncology, cardiovascular and mental health trials and trial activation actually rebound pandemic period starting from June last year, however, less so for US-based trials. Also, uh, enrollment in clinical trials dropped by about half between March and May uh, 2020. Small early clinical trials were more likely to put enrollments on hold due to the safety concerns. Interestingly, that uh, according to the survey uh, conducted by the American Cancer Society, um, almost, um, well, every fifth cancer patient 
reported that he or she would be uh, less likely to participate in a clinical trial completed to non-COVID times. And the predominant reason was the fear of exposure to COVID-19. And of course, subsequently, many clinical trial investigators who placed in-person interactions with alternative approaches conducted remotely, and we've heard a lot about that today. A survey, one of the surveys of 245 uh, clinical trial investigators reported that the proportion of participants' interaction conducted remotely increased from 9% in January 2020 to uh, 57% in May 2020. And of course, um, uh, the overall situation and the urgency led to the situation when funders and regulatory authorities, including the US FDA, um, re responded with a series of various guidelines on how clinical trials could be altered during the, the pandemic times. And these guidelines focused on, of course, reducing COVID-19 exposure or offering alternative um, study settings or care settings. So what happened in Russia? Here is a report uh, made by the Association of Clinical Trial Organizations, and uh, which is one of the um, most reliable organization um, in the in the field of uh, clinical uh, research conduct in Russia. So they reported that, um, contrary to possibly possible expectation that COVID nineteen pandemic uh, would have a huge impact, in reality, it had not so. Um, big impact on the total number of trial approvals in Russia. And this slide talks about industry-sponsored trials. Uh, the, um, you may see there is a slight decrease in 2020, which has been rebounded in, uh, in the first half of 2021. However, uh, we are now uh, seeing, of course, a lot of emergent trials in a new uh, therapeutic area, which we haven't seen before in COVID-19. Uh, and the uh, probably the um, only um, area for slowdown was the time frame for the approvals, which decreased um, substantially, or, um, I'm sorry, increased, actually, the, the timeline increased, so uh, uh, compared to the previous years, and you may see it in the graph here. Uh, so what about academia? Academia is, um, was affected even more by the COVID-19 outbreak because the uh, institutions and clinical centers had to uh, deal with the uh, infection itself. Um, you know, in addition to the organizational concerns and issues with the protocols. So here is one of the examples of uh, a large clinical trial ongoing in Russia, a multicenter trial for acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. And this slide was generously provided to me by um, my brilliant collaborators at the National um, Medical Center for Hematology in Moscow, Russia. And you may see in the table on the left below that uh, in 2020, the overall number of included patients actually dropped. However, it increased uh, and uh, got back to the previous levels in 2021 already. But you may see that it's only due to the uh, big federal centers, not in the regional clinics, because regional clinics are still fighting the COVID-19 infection. And uh, it's important to mention that the uh, number of withdrawals and excluded patients actually increased uh, during the last years uh, due to various... 19 is one of the uh, major among those. Um, of course, the, there were so many limitations brought by COVID-19 in, in our everyday work as a clinical researchers. However, it also opened some new opportunities. As I already mentioned, there is a, no, uh, as absolutely new feature in COVID-19. Uh, and additionally, uh, we, uh, there, there were so many, uh, these opportunities were open for various uh, investigators. So that's how we used this opportunity. We launched a registry uh, of patients with hematologic disease and COVID-19 uh, more than a year ago in June 2020. And uh, throughout the, the, the year of the tri this trial when it was open, uh, we had 15 uh, participating sites from 11 regions and we managed to enroll over 600 uh, disease and COVID-19. Uh, um, meetings, uh, international meetings for hematologists, and uh, the uh, as you see, we managed to demonstrate our primary endpoint. The 30-day see was 18 um, percent, which is really high in these patient populations, and and the vast majority of uh, the deaths 
were due to COVID-19 complications. This data uh, is uh, really uh, important and significant for further um, recommendations on patient care in this vulnerable population. So my, uh, to conclude, uh, my considerations uh, for the considerations of this topic and how the world will probably change um, after the pandemic is hopefully over. Uh, so uh, first of all, for the clinical trials, of course, there was a really hard time and uh, the uh, priorities um, clinical research uh, outside of COVID-19 for many months. However, now we see that the situation is getting better, but we've seen that there were issues with data collection, data sharing, which were which had to be solved, uh, especially for multi-centric trials. Uh, of course, there was a huge opportunity for telemedicine and uh, the uh, I'm sure that the tools that were um, either improved or uh, created or implemented during this time will further be used in uh, various clinical setting and uh, um, and uh, outside of the clinics. Uh, with the protocol flexibilities that, that were allowed during the pandemic, I think there is a um, potential risk for the clinical trial integrity and quality. We'll see how it will affect clinical trial results. Because there are several regulatory changes which may be further implemented outside of the COVID times and may improve uh, the overall landscape of the uh, clinical trial uh, management and organization. However, I think that overall the reduction in new trial um, activations for non-COVID uh, diseases uh, is likely to slow the pace for clinical research and especially new drug discovery and development. So uh, with the long-term uh, potential negative um, consequences for our patients. Messages, messages are the following, and they here they are. So uh, we've seen the immediate effects of pandemic, and they have been overcome for the clinical trial, um, for the clinical research overall. But longer term consequences are yet to be met, and we need to get prepared for that. And uh, however, the on the positive side, the changes that were implemented during the urgency and due to, to urgency may stay and shape the further landscape for the clinical research. For this, I would like to thank my collaborators, the team of the Foundation for Cancer Research Support, the Rockfund team, as well as the Crohn's 19 team, the um, investigators, and especially the PI uh, of, the, uh, of this clinical trial, um, as well as all the patients, their families, investigators, and all the supporters of cancer research. Uh, together, we advance the day when cancer is defeated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Very impressive how you uh, involve all these stakeholders with also the platform Enroll Me. Uh, we don't have much time to have uh, questions now, but we will put you in contact with the people in the public if, if it's needed. Thank you very much, Christina, for being here. Thank you. Here is my email, so please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, ideas. We are very uh, open for collaborations. And thank you. Thank you for being in Moscow time. It's, it's later there. And thank you for the patience. Thank you very much. We will contact you. Thank you. And now you. we move for the last two sessions. We promise you very, very short sessions, Dr. Jordi Piero. We go back to the digital health strategies deployed during COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you very much, Jordi. Jordi has announced me that there is a reception downstairs at some point now. That's yeah, why he and wants I am, to be quick. yeah, I am willing to go to the yes. reception and have my glass of wine very fast. Good. So this will be four minutes. Uh, well, uh, my 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 presentation is about uh, which uh, are the strategies that we put in place in here, in order to well the different digital health strategies and taking advantage of uh, of this uh, opportunity. I'm sure that this uh, image, you have seen it uh, plenty of times, uh, and it's that, uh, well, the healthcare sector was lagging behind in the, in the digital transformation, we all know that, and we took advantage of, of this situation. It, wasn't a, it was not the CEO, not the CIO, the one that uh, pushed for this change. Of course, there were previous uh, infrastructures set in place that helped us, but it was really the COVID, the one that, that pushed forward this. Uh, for me, the, the, the situation that we have faced or the, the, the specific situation that we have had with COVID is a perfect alignment in between an emergency of public health 
and uh, well, digital health being there and being able to 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 solve uh, the situation. We had to protect healthcare centers, professionals, citizens from possible infections. We had to somehow ensure or uh, or to guarantee the the continuity of care. We had to put uh, strategies in order to identify possible cases of of COVID or to treat with patients uh, that had COVID or with other profiles of patients and well avoiding them to come. And well, digital health was there, and I think that we knew how to how to take this uh, opportunity. This is from a paper that we published just uh, one month uh, after the pandemic outbreak here in in Spain in Catalonia. So it was uh, the paper collects all the different things that we did in between 16th of March and then uh, mid uh, April, and it was published early in, in May 2020. Basically, uh, what we did in here was, uh, on the one hand, well, deploy the, as uh, Dr. Vidal was explaining before, all the consultations uh, strategy and the teleconsultations in general, we scaled up this from primary care into, into hospitals. We developed a, an app for self-assessment because as you know, there were no PCR tests or anything like this to test people. Uh, we started the development of a, a, an emotional management application, which was, of course, not developed within that time frame, but we set the foundations for this to happen. Uh, we also had the contact tracing application completely developed. We included uh, data scientists in our teams to help us uh, by managing the, the, the different, well, analyzing the data that, that we had. And all of this uh, just, uh, just in one month. Uh, the literature is full of uh, different evidence of different technologies that have been deployed uh, during the pandemic outbreak. I'm skeptical that most of them will stay in, in routine care. My opinion is that while the model of teleconsultations uh, it's being here and, and, and will stay uh, for the forthcoming uh, years, and I have some slides on this. Uh, lucky me, uh, Josep has also presented them very similar one, so I will be able to jump on this. Patient portals uh, uh, being used as a single point of entry for, uh, for patients has also been deployed. And uh, data scientists uh, are in our organizations, and I think this is good, they are here to stay. And everyone now realizes about the importance of uh, data management in, in healthcare. This is some numbers that have been shown uh, of the changes in the types uh, of visits in primary care. This is just from the same paper. This is just uh, after one month. So a very big decrease of face-to-face uh, -face visits, a very huge increase of uh, telephone visits, and a sustained increase of uh, the consultations and the, and the video consultations. This is some leaflets that we prepare for both organizations and also professionals to implement the teleconsultations for them to know how to do so. Some guidance because we could not perform a proper change management strategy. Uh, those are also numbers from the consultations. This is uh, changing from 2,000 more or less per week to 100,000 per, per, per week. Uh, this is to show that all these remote consultations have been established more or less all across Europe. Spain ranks, uh, I would say, 50-50%, so a bit higher than the, than the OCD ratio uh, in terms of uh, remote consultations and also prescriptions, uh, say, uh, whatever type of electronic prescription. And finally, uh, for us, uh, the COVID has been a super big push for the, uh, the patient portal. We started the strategy of the patient portal back in year 2009. Uh, by the beginning of the pandemic, there were just only 400,000 registered users. And after the pandemic, now we are at 4.5 million citizens that are registered. And well, they consider this their uh, only door of entry, uh, and we are building our strategy. I mean, moving the boundaries of hospitals into the homes of patients, and that's uh, our door to, to reach them, trying to avoid them having too many, too many apps or too many, too many interactions or different user interfaces and user experience. And yeah, that was it. Thank I'm you very much. Six minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Jordi.
And uh, to finish, uh, I will take my turn just today. It's an exception, no? as this is a, a healthy a map uh, conference. I would not use the turn of, of the word if I was going to sell you a company, no? but as I'm going to send you a non-profit, no? I think it's, it's adequate you know, in that sense. So uh, we're going to talk about all this hot topic uh, very quickly. The validation of digital therapeutics in hospitals and primary care, okay? Some of you may be already planning to do that. Uh, if not, you should do it, no? because there is a lot of plenty of room uh, to do it. A lot of companies want to do it, and it would be a good business opportunity. No? Uh, in that sense, uh, if we saw until 2017 in a report of EQA, um, very, very, very few apps were really tested. No? Studies between, or just of efficacy between 2007 and 17, 571 in the world which is very, very, very little. Obviously, the exponential in the pandemic will change that, but the, the numbers are needed to increase very quickly. In where? In probably candidates for this adoption, uh, healthy eating, weight management, pulmonary. This is a huge, massive um, uh, review that was done two, three years ago, but maybe now that has changed. But there are many possibilities. And these are the current digital therapeutics. For the ones who still don't know what a digital therapeutic is, we could discuss it because there is a, some of you here involved in some discussions at big level. Uh, but basically, a tool, a web, an app that goes through a process of uh, validation, a real scientific evidence validation, probably the level of a randomized control trial, at least two randomized control trials, depending on the administration. So FDA says two, two, probably MA will say also that. No? If you see, you can see that some of, for example, Kaya Health, this app, the German app, okay, for back pain, no? uh, it went through two randomized control trials, okay, and it's considered a drug. It can be prescribed with the new legislation of Germany, DIGA. That should come, and we should copy them. Innovation sometimes is copy people, no? The French have copied the Germans already, and the other European countries are starting to copy it, no? So we should look at the Minister of Health and say, please copy that, that law for prescription digital therapeutics. Uh, very quickly, um, some of the tools that uh, have been prescribed, um, uh, tested and validated digital therapeutics, and the startups. Uh, startups uh, need, in that sense, um, the help of hospitals and other uh, institutions, and also low prices if possible. Taking advantage that in Universal Doctor, my company, we are launching another company called Universal Health Digital Access to implement uh, different kind of tools, monitoring, and all different kinds of tools, but we are creating the UDA Association, which is an uh, association that will help other entrepreneurs to try to find the best hospitals, the best primary care centers of the world where they can really validate their study. We're launching soon a website, okay? For example, we have put with some hospitals that we've been already talking, hospital clinic, many hospitals are thinking about that. What I'm doing, what I need, which technology I do need, and, and so on, mobile app, web app. The, the tool will be ready in just two, three weeks. Just if I'm a, an, a GP from New Zealand, I want to validate my tool in Sydney. Okay, it's 3,000 kilometers away, but maybe I can find it. We're talking with different institutions. We have already some concrete agreements with some institutions to start collaborating with them under their umbrella, with them, as always, in a healthy spirit, no? transversally, helping everybody. But especially what we want to do is reduce the price and increase the quality if possible. We know that a study requires a lot of uh, no performance people, uh, statisticians, data scientists, epidemiologists, and so on. But we believe we can systematize that process. So in that sense, the uh, cost is the more important thing. We have analyzed all the costs, and we believe we can point out in some cases, only in some cases, only in some cases, to 50,000 euros validation process complete. Right now, it's not in the market price, but in some aspects, it could be achieved. Other, as other, in other times, it will cost 200,000, 300,000, whatever. But in some places, when we talk about democratization, we have to really do it, everything is possible. So thank you very much. Uh, I will not use more time and help us entrepreneurs and the business is in your side, hospitals and primary care centers. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that,
that, we want to say goodbye to the super session of Helcio and MAP. Um, Bartomeu. No, thanks for, for attending the, the conference. Uh, we encourage uh, you to keep innovation and uh, it's more importantly, share what the, you do. It's very important that they share the, the, the knowledge men in institutions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bartomeu. <laughs> I, think, I, I think we have, we have to highlight that the, the work of Bartomeu, no? with uh, your hospital, the map, and all this coordination, it's an amazing work. Congratulations, it's not easy. In a, in, for the ones who still are listening to us, or uh, Manresa, no? it's an inner land no? in, in the center of Catalonia in a place where nice hospital, no, with surrounding small towns. And it's great, no, what you're doing with it, your twin institution, the FUP, no, and other big important companies like Avinen and all these other companies that you have already embedded, no? I've seen that you have already embedded the innovations of Amalfi, Dr. Roger Ferrer also talked about these other companies, I don't remember the name, sorry, about the in-out no, surgery. <laughs> Congratulations, because this is what I think what we need, no? Services. No? And just to talk about innovation, we want to make a final call to the institutions and the governments to try to train the ones who should be innovating, which are the ones who are paying. No? Mm -hmm. and, and just to remember that until we don't change the model of payment, all what we're doing here is a waste of time uh, until we really change the way of payment innovation. No? So it would be always a far nice reminder to make the innovators no, happy by changing the ones who pay the model. No? From that sense, uh, Healthio wants to help you. Uh, thank you to you all again. You will have news from Healthio soon. Uh, of course, the pandemic stopped all these uh, nice activities that we used to do. Uh, you remember these itineraries, this way of, of enjoying you know, the conference style in a different way. And you will have soon uh, news. And we hope we can work together with all of you. Thank you very much for the support. Uh, thank you very much for being at 6.15 here. And enjoy the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.